Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for <laughs> joining me up here. Um, so we're here about talking about min, uh, minimizing risk during our investment decisions, but let's get started. Let's have you all introduce yourself. And what does risk mean to you in your vertical? Sure, thank you. Hi, I'm Nubar. Uh, I'm CFO, CEO of Madison Park Group, uh, Middle Market Investment Bank. And uh, given where I sit, for me, mostly I think about people's risk, technology risk, and, and compliance risk. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss this today with, with all of you. Great. Uh, my name is Adil, and uh, for the majority of my career, I've been in investment banking. And uh, until 2019, I got involved in SPACs. Those are special purpose acquisition companies. Uh, since then, I've been involved with raising five SPACs, and I've raised about over one billion. And uh, I've announced and completed a SPAC M&A transaction valuing more than three billion. So uh, the risk primarily for me is the risk of my investors, and uh, those are primarily high net worth individuals and hedge funds. And it's very interesting the way we manage their risk, but uh, before getting into more details, I'll let other uh, panelists introduce themselves. Thanks. So I'm Heath Walters. Uh, I'm a CPA. Don't hold it against me, please. Um, I'm the director of tax planning for Accurate Advisory Group, which is a family office that integrates investments, tax planning, and legal all into one house. So tax, tax risk and investment risk, those are the two things that I look at. And most people don't think of it that way, but when you come into the investing world as a CPA, we can actually see things different. So I look at the world as there's IRS risk, tax risk, cost, and then there's investment risk. And you need to understand the two because they work hand in hand. All right, I'm Mark Hilton. Uh, I'm uh, president and CEO of Alpine Gold Exchange out of, uh, based in Alpine, Utah. Um, so we're a precious metals um, dealer, but our real mission is about providing sound money alternatives for, for folks. A lot of people think money is the paper stuff that we carry around. Um, you know, we like to quote uh, J.P. Morgan who said, money is gold, everything else is credit. Um, so really money is, is something that, you know, people want to hold on to obviously. So our clients are concerned mostly about uh, inflation risk. So preserving their wealth, preserving not so much the numerical value of what they have, but more the purchasing power that they, that they earned. And they want to be able to keep that for the rest of their lives or be able to use it as needed. Uh, political risk is also a big concern to our clients. Um, and then, of course, there's business risk that I have to deal with as a CEO. So dealing with credit risk and fraud and so forth. So those are all the kind of things that we're, we're having to deal with. Thank you. I'm Leon Burks, as I was introduced. I'm the CEO and founder of LP Ventures. And basically what we do is we do roll-up acquisitions. So we look for fragmented business sectors, um, complementary businesses, and see the, not only just the operational and uh, financial fit, but also the cultural fit as well. And that way we can secure the legacies of the previous um, business owners and their path on their first exits, primarily. Their first and last exits, most likely. But um, Based upon that, let's go with Heath. Like, how do you bridge the education gap with your clients um, to help them come to the best decision in, when it, in regards to risk? So that's an interesting perspective for me, um, considering I think I might deal with some of the most technical and complicated stuff um, out there. And you know, I've, I've spent the last, I think, five years um, not as much on the education in the technical side, but learning how to actually communicate advanced tax to people that are not tax accountants. And um, that's actually been extremely difficult, to be honest. Um, that's, you know, interpretation. So what I've learned is that when I spend a lot of time with financial advisors, their role and their job is to communicate to clients. My job as a CPA is very technical in nature, generally speaking. So you need to have somebody to help interpret. And we've spent a lot of time developing the interpretation of technical tax so that the rest of the world can understand what we're talking about. Um, and we've put a lot of things together to be able to educate. And most of, in, in our practice, most of what we do is about simplifying the time that it takes. And, you know, I could take one client and spend 40 hours with them. 
I could take one client, the same client and spend four. And both of us would rather spend four. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Mubar, what about the people and technology risk as your experience as a CFO in your organization? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I work in an investment bank. Uh, we're in the advisory business, which is a little bit different than a consulting business. Um, the difference being that consultants give you a deck and tell you have a nice day. Advisors, you got to do what they say, or you engage them because you're going to do exactly what they say. Um, from that standpoint, on our balance sheet, right, as you guys would expect. On the asset side, we don't have anything. We have just our people. So from a risk standpoint, it's execution risk because we want to make sure that we have the best advice ever to give to people. So what matters to us is hiring the right people, making sure that they're going to execute the way our clients expect us to execute. So for me, risk is mostly on the HR side. It's very much of a cultural but also at the same time, um, just idiosyncratic risk in that sense. Um, we care a lot about the harmony that people bring into the firm because that's exactly what the clients will see. Um, in addition to that, obviously, we care about people who are trainable, who are coachable, of course, so we can get to where we need. From a technological risk standpoint, I mean, um, one of the difficulties we faced is that when COVID hit, we all had to go home instantly and suddenly. Um, if we didn't have the right technologies in place to communicate effectively, it would have taken us months to kind of put that in place. Luckily, we have done that a little bit earlier, but um, that's actually one aspect of, of, uh, of, our t of today's business, is that the, of, of you know, the present time that is changing the face of the business. The more you invest in technology, the more speed you gain. But then you also have to think about what is your competition doing? Why am I spending this money on this technology? How is it actually going to make me faster? And how are my people going to adapt to it? So, um, you know, from a, from a general perspective, we really uh, have to be thoughtful before we make an, we make, before we make an investment. Um, but again, like I say initially, the power that you are able to unlock by hiring the right people is actually a lot more than you know, CEOs or you know, firm leaders think. Uh, it's actually everything, especially for consultant or for mostly advisory businesses, it's everything. So my message would be to just be very, very considerate when you're hiring. Yeah. So Adil, you've put together very powerful teams to get a lot of successful engagements done. So how does the savvy of your clients and your teams affect your response to risk and like what is like a major skill set that pretty much all of us can take away to help us get there? Sure. Um, thanks, Leon. Um, so I think before, uh, because financial risk can be pretty broad, right? So I'll start by explaining first what SPAC is and how financial risk plays a key role for our investors uh, in this world, right? So SPAC is our special purpose acquisition company. Uh, SPAC is like it's a black shell company raised by individuals who's been pretty successful in operating public companies, and they've been like pretty successful in being like a uh, you know, private equity or a hedge fund person, and they have a long track record. And then once you uh, complete the IPO of a SPAC, your goal is to bring a high quality private company to public markets now. So, uh, you know, like if you think about it, like when there are three aspects how our investors invest in our SPAC. So number one is basically, uh, you know, you come in and add risk capital, which is the riskiest tranche, where you buy shares at a discount. But the, uh, but the cash there is if a SPAC does not complete a transaction within a given timeline, then the SPAC gets liquidated, and all the IPO investors get their money back. However, the at-risk investors lose all their investments, right? But if the deal is completed, their returns are, you know, like uh, compared to like IPO investors are higher. Now the second tranche is the IPO investors. You come in at ten dollars a share, and typically, you know, your money is put in a trust account. And if you don't like the transaction, you can redeem your shares, and you know, you get your ten dollars back. The third way they, they participate in the SPAC is by pipe, which is private investment in public entity, right? And pipes are an important part of a SPAC because. 
you know, they, you need to bring a pipe when you're completing a transaction to instill confidence in the public markets. Now, if you look at these three, you know, risk brackets, you will instantly realize that all, to, you know, th there's a diversification aspect to it. So to answer your question, I think like diversity is extremely important for our investors, right? So when we are advising them like in which basket to invest their capital, in the background, we are also kind of doing the asset allocation so their risk, so their adjusted risk profile is pretty sustainable because if you see, the equity markets are extremely volatile at the moment, right? So we are, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that, you know, how can we, protect our investors again against that volatility. So I think by having the right amount of diversification is extremely important. Because if your assets are not, not diversified, you know, there's a heavy chance you can lose a lot of your money. So I think understanding the risk, quantifying the risk that you're putting your money into is extremely important. And as long as you have, uh, you know, your, your risk is appropriately diversified, I believe there's a, you know, there, there's a way you can, you know, you can get away with it, right? So I think my advice would be to like educate yourself, make sure that, uh, you know, you understand what you're getting into and, you know, you put, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. They should be in very different baskets. So, you know, you, you are protected against the volatility that we're seeing at the moment. Awesome. And Mark, how about you? How do you, how do you help your clients? Um, understand and minimize that risk for them? So I think the first step really is to to listen to the clients, figure out what they're concerned about. Um, it, you don't want to come out with a you know packaged solution like you just need to buy a bunch of gold and you'll be fine. It's not going to work for everybody. Um, I think you know the concepts we try to get across are and we don't teach it this way but probably most of us here you know with have had finance classes and you learn about the you know, various uh, efficient portfolios and diversification and so forth and, and equity versus, you know, fis fixed uh, income. And when I learned this, it was, um, you know, you have the risk-free return, which normally was, was like a 10-year T-bond, you know, or T, uh, you know, something like that, treasury. And, and then you have a beta that you apply to the portfolio of equities that you have or, or uh, fix that uh, income. And so what we normally tell people is, okay, great, what's your, what's your risk-free return on a 10-year 10, 10 T-bill right now? Um, you know, maybe it's paying one or 2%, but inflation's 10%, so it's actually negative 8%. That's um, not a good place to start. So it's a pretty easy pitch to say, instead of using a T-bill, just use gold for that. I mean. For the last 2,600 years, gold has basically proven to resist or be sort of inflation-proof if it's a long enough period of time. Since we went off the gold standard, we've been growing at about 8% a year, which isn't, it's about the same as the Dow Jones has done uh, during that same period of time. So we basically tell people, take a portion of your portfolio, put it into precious metals. Uh, we focus on legal tender. Um, versions of that, so U.S. Mended, Gold Eagle, Silver Eagle, Gold Buffalo, that's all we deal with. Um, and so uh, the advantage of that is that there, you can use it for, in certain instances, you can use it for commerce. You know, if you actually spend that legal tender, you can avoid capital gains and so forth. There's some advantages. But it's that simple concept to say, you know, you need a diver diversification. If you don't have something that is resistant to inflation, you're just gonna be climbing uphill the whole time. Uh, you know, if you're starting at negative 10%, you know, people brag about their 12, 15% return, but you gotta subtract out what inflation has done, and right now we're seeing that more and more. So that's, that's kind of the basic education that we do with people. Uh, we also tell them that, you know, most people think of gold and silver as a store and hold. You put it into a vault, you put it in your mattress, you bury it in your backyard. Um, and this is what a lot of our clients do. I mean, they'll come in and they'll say, I found this in my parents' backyard, you know, what, what can you do with this? And, and we'll say, um, you can actually invest it. So we do have some tools for people to lease that. So you can now lease it back to us and we sort of broker that, and you can get a return on your holdings, so you're not paying a vaulting fee and so forth. So 
we offer up to 3.5%, depending on the size of that lease, and that's what you would call a real return. So that's really over inflation. Um, now, I won't say that gold is going to track inflation every day of the, of the year. It's going to bounce around. We see that, right? But overall, if you're going to hold it long enough, and most of our clients do, they're in this for you know years, um, they're, you can be pretty confident that that's a, it's a very low risk of way of preserving your purchasing power and then potentially getting a, a return. So those are, those are things we do for, for our clients. It's not so much the business risk that we deal with, but that's, that's uh, you know, for our set of clients, uh, that seems to resonate pretty well with them. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. I know with, um, with us and what we do with roll-ups, uh, buying, buying any business inherently comes with risk, right? So what makes our vehicle pretty powerful is that while, we, while we're able to put together complementary businesses, we inherently negate or extremely mitigate the risk of the, of, of the single businesses that we're, the single business that we're buying. And so with that, for instance, if there's a leadership or a leadership team issue or problem with one business, but the business still is profitable. We have complementary businesses that have stronger leadership teams that can still run that other business. So we're able to um, on, put all the teams on one accord with one single business team with with the with single management, and so that enables that enables not only ourselves but our fellow investors um, and future and future. Um, mergers and acquisitions uh, targets, it just it gives them that warm and fuzzy that we all like to see, like, yeah, I know I can make the right decision. Yeah, I can trust this team. Um, but also coming from a lean portfolio management standpoint, uh, working with a lot of, um, based in Houston, working with a lot of um, oil and gas operators, looking at the overall portfolio from the project side of the house, um, we have a lot of stage gates. And with those stage gates, it's like, okay, does it meet a strate strategic vision? the strategic objectives of the company, yes or no, is it a pet project of a business, um, vertical, yay or nay. I'm like, we have an 80-point checklist for any new venture and any new idea, and, and it has to meet, it has to get a, it has to meet like a 90% um, go, it's like a 90% slash go, no go. If you meet that, you can go on to the next step. So that eliminates all unnecessary monies being spent. Um, and then we, we just do that throughout the course of the projects or out the course of the, the new ventures or anything going on. So that's one way we look at risk and we can minimize it through just either accepting it by, by having complimentary services take it over. So, um, so one thing about risk is that a lot of things that we do, we do everything we can to minimize and lower the risk for ourselves and our clients. But what about the third parties, like political situations and or like um, legislative risk? Like how do we, what's, how do we handle that with you? So we're gonna start with uh, Mark on that. Yeah, so as I mentioned, this is a concern of a lot of our clients, right? So, um, you know, we, we have a wide range of folks and with various views, political views and so forth, but some of them do look to uh, precious metals. At, I mean, if you look through history, every time there was turmoil in in an economy, the that economy, when it sort of came through that, almost always went back to precious metals as the base for their their monetary system. And we're not really on that now with the fiat system, you know. So that is one one of the things that we offer certain communities that are extremely concerned about that uh, is the ability to continue to function through. Um, you know, legal tender that actually has true value. We, we have um, a unique product called a gold back, which is actually looks like a dollar bill, but it's actually made of gold. And there's different denominations from a one one thousandth of an ounce up to uh, one twentieth of an ounce. And so people look at that and they're investing in them, they're holding them, they're actually starting to spend them with merchants who are accepting them because they actually have value. It doesn't have to be gold backed, in, meaning the gold isn't held in a vault. You're actually carrying around with you in your wallet uh, in a very usable form. So these are some techniques that people look to to say, if the dollar completely you know, dropped tomorrow, um, and, and we are seeing some concerns with you know, foreign, I think it's about 60% of US dollars are overseas. So uh, if 
foreign entities stop using the dollar to settle transactions? Where are those dollars going to come? Probably back to the U.S. How do we deal with that? Um, so, you know, you can take these things to an extreme, but the people that are trying to deal with that risk or that concern that, that keeps them up at night, didn't, just the idea that I've got something that I know has some value to people during difficult times and I'll be able to continue to enact, trans, you know, uh, for goods and services, I'll be able to transact. And this, of course, doesn't fit all psyches, but it's, it's our little niche, if you will, of folks that we, we support uh, in this. And, and so, you know, they're also very interested about what happens when an EMP hits, you know? What's our, what's our response? What if the network goes down? Everything, we, we, this whole meeting has been about Bitcoin and digital. You know, what if you don't have access to the cloud for a period of time? What happens to your money? Uh, those kinds of things that we're trying to deal with, and those can come during war, they can come during extreme political environments. So that's that's kind of our focus, is in those maybe extreme cases. But in he in, in the tax situations, I know political and legislation um, issues can definitely change the way you operate. So tell us about that. We could just break out and do about a four-hour session on tax law and changes <laughs> that happens with that one. Um, so, personally, I'm, I'm about to be through my third major tax law change. Um, I'm sure Biden will have that coming out um, since I've really learned tax planning. And what I found interesting with it, like learning tax planning, which you, you know, they don't teach you this stuff in school, you really have to be mentored, is that the foundation of tax planning actually works regardless of what the tax law is. And last year, I think for most higher net worth clients, the estate planning changes, the tax law changes, the increasing of the rates, the, hey, we're gonna put in capital gains rates, and we're, by the way, we're gonna retroactive it three months back behind and make you pay more than what you thought you would have paid three months ago. You know, things like that that are unheard of. Um, I mean, there were laws last year to retroactively change the law back to 2016. I mean, imagine that. You, you know, it's kinda like buying a truck. You, you know, you buy a truck, we're told that we can write it off, and all of a sudden, five years ago, I can't, and now I gotta pay taxes and penalties and interest? Like, that doesn't make sense. But the foundation of those things don't actually come true. They don't actually come about because it's just political disaster. Like, no one will get reelected if you do that. So, what I've seen with it over my time is every time that we raise a tax law, we also bring another incentive. If you think about um, carbon credits, if you think about solar credits, batteries, how did Tesla get so big? They lived on credits that the government offers. So what we've seen with this is the foundation of tax laws is actually pretty simple. When they bring a new increase, where were the offsetting decreases and how does the client monetize those? In last year, what I saw was every time they changed the law, which was probably about every month for 10 months, and you had a new tax law projection last year. And it was, well, we had to rewrite the plan. By the end of the year, I gave up. I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I can't rewriting it. But the, the concept of it was each time they changed it, we're like, well, if we flip this here, it'll work. If we flip this here, it'll work. It didn't really matter how they changed it. So for me, the political risk is they're going to change laws. From a client perspective, are you positioned with the tax planning and the investment team that can understand how to be able to take advantages of the strengths and the offsetting positives that we are embraced to utilize, like all of our senators use. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we're getting a little close on time before we have questions. So this one's for a deal in the board. Um, what, if, if, we, if the audience could walk away with one thing at the end of this conference about risk and how to minimize it for investment decisions, what is the one thing you would like to have them walk away with? First of all, you need to have set standards. You need to know exactly what you're able to tolerate and what you're not able to tolerate. This is risk. At the end of the day, there's no decision, no investment, no business, no achievement, no success, nor anything without you taking the risk. So it's all about what you are comfortable with. And when I say you, it has many layers, right? So you as a leader, Personally, you're going to have some comfort and some discomfort with a risk, but then you being comfortable with a certain risk you're taking, it doesn't mean that the firm in itself would also be comfortable. So, um, you know, the right leadership would have set 
the right standards for what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what is stomachable, and what is not. Um, my message would be, first of all, from a leadership standpoint, have an agreement on exactly how much you're willing to stick your neck out, given the political climate. Be confident when you make the decision, because you considered the risks. But most of all, always have certain standards and certain floors and ceilings, but definitely floors, as to you say, okay, this is the minimum or the maximum I'm willing to accept. This is the maximum I'm willing to risk. And then beyond that, just be confident in those boundaries that you set for yourself and your firm, and don't let your own risk tolerance kind of get in the way of interfering with the firm's policies. And that's, I think, translates back to what I said earlier is with hiring, right? You definitely need to hire leaders or people who are willing to take risks, but also people who are also people who are willing to kind of consider a 360 view of a risk rather than, hey, I just feel comfortable with this today, yeah. in a sense. Um, I would <clears throat> agree with whatever uh, Noah just said here. Um, I would just like to add that. I think for, for me, like risks, as I said, diversification is very important. Uh, I think the way you built your portfolio and your asset allocation is a key here, right? Because um, as what we see what's happening politically around the globe, and especially for me and my investors, like we invest in companies, those are not pri always based in, in the US, right? And then let's say if that company is becoming a publicly traded company by merging with our SPAC, I think the important thing here is to understand like you're working with the right set of advisors, right? Uh, when you're performing your due diligence on those companies, you need to make sure that those companies are as good as they can be. They are, they are the future leaders. They have the right management team, right? So I think Absolutely. that all translates into risk diversification, right? Because you will have all sets of companies and uh, some are high risk, some are low risk, but the way you manage that risk and the way you diversify your portfolio will ultimately at the end of the day will determine the outcome um, of the risk that you took. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to open the floor to questions. Oh, in the back? Yes. Thank you. Um, if you could, from your standpoint, what are some main, um, I guess you would say, qualities or traits that we should take into consideration when we are trying to make the decision to either go with a consultant or an advisor when it comes to making these risks and expanding our portfolios. So, you know, if we wanted to hire somebody to assist us on this process, what is something that you think we should make sure that they have and that we ask them to test their knowledge and stuff? I Initially, um, and then I'll pass it off, Initially, the question is, I, well, I believe the question is, what should we at, be able to ask the consultants? Or like, how can we kind of test the waters with them so we know we're getting the right person? Is yeah, that like, it? Yeah, like what quality should they have? Like, you know, because they may be able to answer the question, but they still may not meet like certain qualities. Okay, I, I definitely would, initially I would say, do they match your culture? Um, what, whatever that it may be, because I, grew up in a very aggressive, um, in your face, you no, know, like just data. We'll, we can become friends later after work environment, but that may not work with you as a consultant. For, for me being your consultant. And so you have to initially know who you are and who your organization needs um, trait wise, but also you have to have that standard of like, this is what, you have to know almost what you don't know to be able to ask those questions, to be able to, re to find the research, to be able to ask the necessary questions, to get that warm and fuzzy for you and your organization. But, um, yeah. uh, I would say that, um, uh, you know, like a track record is extremely important. What I mean by that is that the, per the advisors that you're willing to work with, I think it's important to know like what their track record is. If they've like done something similar with a different client and what the outcome of that was, right? So I think like you would know like what sort of what sort of qualities you're looking for in an advisor for any particular investment. So I think the important thing here would be that uh, you know like they have a track record in that space, and the track record of success is very important because if if they're just like 
generalist like everybody else, I think it will be really hard to determine if they will be able to live up to your expectations or not. Um, I think I want to kind of combine the two answers for my panelists here. First of all, you're absolutely right, Leon. Um, in choosing your advisor, you also, first of all, have to know who you are. Because advisors mainly work with CEOs uh, and CFOs, but mainly with sort of top leaders. And a lot of the work gets done behind closed curtains, and no one in the company even knows that you're transacting until the day of, almost, usually. Um, so first of all, you have to know in yourself what kind of a leader you are, what kind of a CEO you are, what kind of people you tolerate. If you are hands-on, hands-off, organized, disorganized, you rely on people, you rely on yourself, that's really important for you to choose you know, your advisor. Second of all, you have to really know where you stand and where your company stands today and what problems you're sitting on and what problems you're looking for that advisor to solve. It's, not, it's never actually about a transaction. A transaction gets done eventually, but it's about your advisor choosing the right counterparty for you, choosing the right tone, right language, and you know, help you set the right image out for you. So definitely and absolutely track record, uh, specifically a concentrated track record or a focused track record in exactly what you're trying to do. Uh, you definitely have to pick honest people, but then again, today, we're, it's all about, inf it's, an, it's the information era. You Google any of an advi any advisor's name on broker check, it's gonna come out. Any disclosures, anything about them, you're going to know. But, more, you know. but moreover than that, you have to find people that you are comfortable trusting their advice and comfortable when they tell you today is the time or today is not the time, you know, to go out. So, you know, one of the most important questions, for example, that I would ask, you know, an advisor is, what do you think about going out to market next year versus today? And kind of listen to that answer. I think that would be the, that would be a good test, I'd say. You know, I'll just say, I, I think it's good to get a, a variety of input and opinions from people. A lot of times we want to hire people or bring in advisors to sort of already agree with us because it's easier. You want people that'll challenge your your assumptions and make you really think and and you know stay convinced with your or or change. You know, so it's I think it's good to avoid that group think kind of uh, uh, phenomenon that can occur in, in advisory roles. And make sure that your team is qualified. And what I mean by that is, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> it's so easy. And I mean, I had the joy or the curse of putting together legal CPA and investment advisors. I mean, these are three totally different things that everybody is the smartest person in the room. So for someone to humble themselves and say, I actually don't know how to make that recommendation, it's really hard for a CPA to do. It's hard for an attorney to do. So you have to be able to make that decision. Does your team understand what decisions they're guiding you on? and how much experience do they have in that one space. And if they don't, get another team or someone in that can quarterback it. Did I help you? Yes, great. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, very insightful, um, and it's a good learning experience for us as well. I have a quick question. You talked about diversification, putting your eggs in different baskets. And again, um, as Warren Buffett and you know, uh, Tony Robbins, they talk about, you know, you just have your eggs in the basket, which you know, is, well, you, you understand that it's going to grow and watch it carefully. So can you please uh, ex elaborate on that two ideologies? Uh, because diversification, it's from investors' point of view, it is not... Uh, maximizing the benefits which could, there's, there's potential to maximize the benefits by investing um, where you know or you can predict that the stock's going to go up. Um, on the other hand, uh, when it is not diversified, of course, your risk will, will, will be higher. Um, so can you please elaborate on that and just shed some light? Sure, um, I'll try my best to answer that. But uh, I think uh, the way I will explain this analogy is, um, I think 
when, like, for instance, we'll take an example of, like, you know, if, uh, if I'm investing in a handful of SPACs, let's say 10 or 15, right? So I think we think about it more as a, for our investors too, right, like when you're making VC investments, right? You make investments in like, let's say, 20 to 30 companies. Now, from your experience, you're investing in the best of the best companies, but in realistically speaking, out of those 30 companies, maybe one or two are like the one that you will have like 100 times returns, and more than 20 will fail, right? So I think that's the same concept here. So when, when, when our investors are investing in our various like SPAC, SPACs or the, you know, the, the VC round that we're doing for other CAD, what are my chances if one or two things will go 50 or 100 times, right? Because at the end of the day, it becomes a more of a number game. Uh, because uh, you, know, you, you can't pretty much predict like, where things are gonna land. And I think now I will get into my second point. That would be that you need to have like, a long-term view, right? Like, to give you one example, like, equity markets are pretty uh, terrible at the moment, right? They're in a correction. They're extremely volatile, right? And majority of the time, if you look at the growth stocks that pretty much like I look at, uh, they've been like hammered for the past few weeks, right? Now, if my investors are not that sophisticated, like some of them, let's say, if they, are, they have a very short-term horizon, they must be freaking out at the moment, like, oh, wow, like, what's happening with my investment? But the investors, those are more sophisticated or has been like investing with us or the other teams for a while, they know that, you know, there's always like a, a, a cyclicality to it, right? They will go down, they will go up. So you need to have like a long-term horizon and you need to make, and put money in the investments that you believe five years out the door will be trading at a multiple that you feel comfortable with, that you're truly betting on the management. Hope, hope that answers your question. Uh, no, I would say I, I started my career in venture and uh, even though we invested in growth companies, I had a lot of uh, connections with, with early stage and seed stage venture capital funds and I also happened to advise a couple of funds uh, overseas and, and uh, a lot of those folks have to make a decision based on a team. A team and a code, that was a very famous expression. Uh, again, it comes back to people risk. It comes back to understanding exactly where you're putting your money, who you're putting your money with, because an idea is an idea, right? It came about you know, based on thought and, and analysis, et cetera. But as we all know, companies, especially you know, startups, they pivot. You know? they, have, they have an objective when they start, they take money, they kind of follow through and then they pivot, they change, they adapt, et cetera. You cannot foresee any of that, but you, what you can you know, filter through is the grit and the tenacity and the quality of the, I would say at this point, the founder or the founders that you're investing in. So looking for people who are truly unequivocally sort of set, determined, can make something work, I think that ultimately translates into safety in venture. I think hitting you? different segments would be perfect too. What I mean by that is a little bit of real estate, a little bit of, uh, like you're, you do different industries in yours, right? So hitting different industries because you've got all the political risks, the tax risks, all of those things hit and to minimize those across the board. That really A little bit of gold. Yeah, a little bit of gold. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. My question for the panel was that uh, when you look at uh, companies, especially that are early stage companies, there's sometimes a fear in the mind of the CEO or the business leader that if he leans too much on, uh, on, on functions like risk, compliance, taxation, they're looked upon more as control functions and you know, there's a fear that may really slow the business down. Right? It doesn't always happen, but there are some CEO, CEOs or business leaders who approach control functions with that mentality. My question was that how, in those situations, how do you flip the paradigm and basically position these control functions as profit optimization or value optimization for the organization as pure control basically functions that, that would be basically you know, slow the business down or say no. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, one thing I look for is like everyone has their thing, right? So for me, I love getting down to weeds and trying to solve the strategic problem. Um, 
but I'm not necessarily good at the one who's implementing that solution. I can give you the solution, but I'm not the one that can do it. So when you have a CEO that's hyper-focused on one thing, you have to make sure, especially when we build uh, management teams to, to move forward with, you have to be able to surround him with the right people. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a people thing. Like business is a contact sport, and we all agree with that, so you have to have the right team on your side to be able to absorb the blows of fate, which we all inevitably take, right? So be able to turn, but using that as a, as a, a as making it profitable, you just have to let that person, the, C, the CEO, the, CEO, the C-suite, the executive, whoever, let them get out their own way. You have to be able to, um, one thing I've done, and I've reached out to executive, certain executive coaches that are, that have a, that, um, that are based in anthropology and not those that are based off of uh, quick certification classes, right? So you can understand human behavior. And then once that person understands and learns more about themselves, and then they'll be able to turn that um, quote unquote perceived negative for, of hyper focus, the, the back away, see the 50 foot thousand view, then you go, uh, that, then that allows the rest of the team to breathe and they can help them on the path. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question a little bit. I was gonna say, we're actually unfortunately out of time um, My apologies. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, but I wanted to thank you, gentlemen, for uh, coming here today and putting together this panel and thank great you. information. Thanks. Thank you for having us.